Good morning, little masters, and welcome to today's Tolkien Times. I'm Alan, the man of the West, also from the Prancing Pony podcast. And today's Tolkien Times is my way of bringing you a little Middle Earth every single day. Now, of course, if the few minutes that you get here isn't enough, be sure to listen to the Prancing Pony podcast, seven years worth of long episodes as we walk our way through the legendarium. But let's get started today with Third Age Thursday. Now, we're going to take the time on Thursdays to revisit familiar and favorite moments from The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, as well as maybe some lesser-known stories of the Third Age. I'll read a short passage and discuss it a little bit, just enough to remind us of what helped most of us fall in love with Middle-earth. I say most of us because some people were crazy enough to start with the Silmarillion or Unfinished Tales or something like that. Now, today we're going to read a passage from The Lord of the Rings in which very little happens. Truth is, it's mostly a landscape description, but I want you to close your eyes, if it's safe for you to do so, of course, and imagine this at each step of the way as Frodo, Sam, and Pippin make their way out of Hobbiton. And I'll be reading from this edition of Fellowship of the Ring. For a short way, they followed the lane westwards. Then leaving it, they turned left and took quietly to the fields again. They went in single file along hedgerows and the borders of coppices, and night fell dark about them. In their dark cloaks, they were as invisible as if they all had magic rings. Since they were all hobbits and were trying to be silent, they made no noise that even hobbits would hear. Even the wild things in the fields and woods hardly noticed their passing. After some time, they crossed the water west of Hobbiton by a narrow plank bridge. The stream was there no more than a winding black ribbon bordered with leaning alder trees. A mile or two further south, they hastily crossed the great road from the Brandywine Bridge. They were now in the Tookland, and bending southeastwards, they made for the Green Hill country. As they began to climb its first slopes, they looked back and saw the lamps in Hobbiton far off, twinkling in the gentle valley of the water. Soon it disappeared in the folds of the darkened land, and was followed by the bywater beside its gray pool. When the light of the last farm was far behind, peeping among the trees, Frodo turned and waved a hand in farewell. I wonder if I shall ever look down into that valley again, he said quietly. When they had walked for about three hours, they rested. The night was clear, cool, and starry, but smoke-like wisps of mist were creeping up the hillsides from the streams and deep meadows. Thin-clad birches, swaying in a light wind above their heads, made a black net against the pale sky. They ate a very frugal supper for hobbits, and then went on again. Soon they struck a narrow road that went rolling up and down, fading gray into the darkness ahead, the road to Woodhall and Stock and the Bucklebury Ferry. It climbed away from the main road in the water valley and wound over the skirts of the green hills towards Woody End, a wild corner of the east farthing. After a while, they plunged into a deeply cloven track between tall trees that rustled their dry leaves in the night. And then after a bit of dialogue, we come back to read... Just over the top of the hill, they came on the patch of fir wood. Leaving the road, they went into the deep, resin-scented darkness of the trees and gathered dead sticks and cones to make a fire. Soon, they had a merry crackle of flame at the foot of a large fir tree, and they sat round it for a while until they began to nod. Then, each in an angle of the great tree's roots, they curled up in their cloaks and blankets and were soon fast asleep. Now... Why would I pick that passage to read? Because it is passages like these that give us a glimpse of the real beauty of the Shire, that help us understand why Frodo is doing what he's going to do. The sacrifices he makes are not in a vacuum. He makes them for a reason, and the beauty of the Shire is one of those reasons. As Hammond and Skull put it in their excellent Reader's Companion, one of the true must-haves in any Tolkien library, if Tolkien had hurried Frodo and his companions into adventure, we would not appreciate so well the Arcadia, which is an idyllic paradise in harmony with nature, that Frodo is willing to give up for the sake of his people. Proceeding at the author's deliberately casual pace, we grow to love the Shire as we never loved Bag End in The Hobbit, having visited there so briefly before Bilbo was hurried away. Now, of course, I'll pick more than my fair share of the dramatic and intense moments going forward on this segment. I mean, think about it. The Siege of Gondor, the Ride of the Rohirrim. There are so many amazingly powerful moments. But if there's a bit of the story that you'd like me to read and chat about, let me know by emailing barlaman at the Prancing Pony Podcast. 
Folks, join me again tomorrow on today's Tolkien Times as I welcome a very special guest for our first ever Fandom Friday. Now, please like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you're listening on a podcast app, be sure to subscribe to make sure that every episode gets downloaded to your device. Follow at Tolkien Times on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And in the words of Faramir, go with the goodwill of all good men.